Um, so I started off my first two weeks in Jeremiah chapter 1. I dealt with the fact that God knew Jeremiah, or who's put my phone on, before Jeremiah was even born. Okay? God had his hold on Jeremiah's life, etc., etc. I did that over two weeks. Then the third week, I jumped to Jeremiah chapter 7. And in chapter 7, it's with that part where they say, God says to the nation, don't say the temple, the temple, the temple. Don't lean into your religiosity thinking that that's going to put you in a safe space. It's a relationship with God. That was two weeks ago. Now, today, we're jumping even further to chapter 18. And I'm going to read a passage of scripture to you. So if you've got your Bible, you can open to Jeremiah 18. uh, And I'm, I'm just going to go for it. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation, excuse me, I warned, repents of its evil, I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I'd planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, if it does evil in my sight, does not obey me, I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. And then it goes on in verse 9, says, look, I'm, verse 11, God says, look, I'm planning, there's going to be an evil coming unless you guys repent. Verse 12, but they will reply, it's no use. We will continue with our own plans. Each of us will follow the stubbornness of his evil heart. These people needed a flipping good hiding. Are you with me? Then, verse 13, th- th- this is what the Lord says. Inquire among the nations. Has anyone ever heard anything like this? A most horrible thing has been done by virgin Israel. This is what bothers God. This is what he says. Does the snow of Lebanon ever vanish? From its rocky slopes. Do its cool waters from distant sources ever cease to flow? Yet my people have forgotten me. They've been incensed to worthless idols, blah, blah, blah. And so it carries on. Verse 18, look how the nation responds. Then they said, come, let us make plans against Jeremiah. For the teaching of the law by the priest will not be lost, nor will counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophets. So come, let's attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anything he says. Poor Jeremiah. Can you imagine? By the way, I'm just trying to see if that oak is here this morning. The other week I started off, I said, do you know who Jeremiah is? Oak in our church turned to his wife and said, yeah, Jeremiah is a bullfrog. <laughs> and she says she couldn't concentrate on the preach the whole morning. Because all she was thinking is, Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Where is that? Is that oak here this morning? I'm trying to see that his wife tunes, he wrecked the whole morning for a Jeremiah. Was a, Jeremiah was not just a bullfrog. He was a prophet in the nation of Israel. Okay. Warren, are you here? I just want to check. No confession of sin here this morning. All right. He's always here. Unless he was at the previous meeting. Okay, so. Jeremiah gets a word from God. He goes and I'll explain the context now. He gets a word from God. He's got to go give the people. And as usual, God tells him, you give the word, but I'm telling you now, this is how they're going to respond to me. And so my title, obviously, for this morning is uh, The Potter's Wheel. The Potter and the Clay. Let me start off by saying this. Art is a fascinating subject. Art. It's a powerful tool for communicating feelings and events. An artist shows you what's happening while it's happening. I don't know about you, I hated art at school. <laughs> you know you've got to draw, like draw a tree. Draw this and look at it and let it speak to you. Like, oh, I hated art. I did not know you can fail art. <laughs> Until. But art, now, of course, I'm a little bit older. I love art. I think art is very expressive. I, have, I love to, in fact, in fact, this is not in the preach, this is for free. But I was ministering in... Um, in uh, 
Seattle, which is right up in the north of America. Any of you ever watch Frasier? You know, all, everyone's depro. Seattle gets 30 days of sun a year. Highest suicide rates in the United States. I preached at this huge, well, I preached, I ministered at this huge church um, called Overlake. And um, we, we, there's a place in Seattle right by, if you look on a clear day, you can almost see Canada. It's just around the corner there. And uh, the, you know Seattle Coffee Shop? The first ever one was there. There. I went in there, had a coffee at the first ever place where they sold Seattle. So anyway, so we go, we have, it's a fish market thing, we go, we have a, and then I walk out, and I look to my right, and there's a huge sign called the SAM, S-A-M, Seattle Art Museum. I went in there, you won't believe it, my favorite artist on planet Earth had all his stuff on display. <laughs> Any of you... Any of you know the art of Paul Gauguin? Right. Contemporary of Vincent van Gogh. They're borrowed from each other. I had the privilege for two hours of being this close to all Gauguin stuff. Almost everything was at the big security. Art. It was amazing. I just loved every... So I bought the guy bought me a book. I've got it at home. It's beautiful. Art is fascinating. And what happens is God begins his journey with Jeremiah. With a display, if you like, with art, where he tries to show him from the beginning that our lives are set on the central theme of the sovereignty of God. This theme permeates the life and ministry of Jeremiah. I formed you, I knew you, I sanctified you, and I ordained you before you were born. You had no say in the issue. You were a little cell in your mother's womb, and I started to fashion you according to the way I wanted you to be. The sovereignty of God. Now, Jeremiah's understanding of this relationship with God was irrevocable. What I mean is, as a young man, as Jeremiah learned about God, what he learned about God, no one could ever take away from him. It was his. He'd learned it. And I want to say to you today, please don't ever reach the place where you stop growing in your knowledge of God. Don't sit back there, fold your arms and say, you know, I'm, I'm growing up and I've, I've kind of figured this out. And I, I, I want to say to you, you silly sod, you can never, ever, ever stop growing in your knowledge of God. Ever. And when you think that you have typed God down to a few scriptures where you get God to do what you want because of some things you believe, you're an infant, you're a child, you're immature and you need to grow up. I want to tell you this as well, my revelation. I've, only, I've served the Lord since 1989, so 34 years now. I've walked with Jesus every day. And I want to tell you this. I have more questions now than I had earlier. For the simple reason that God keeps getting bigger. I read his word. I know his word. I've read the Bible through cover to cover every year for 34 years. But I'm still blown away by what I see because of the sovereignty of God. And you don't grow up in a static understanding of God. You grow up in a relationship with God which is complex. It's dynamic. It's deep. It grows as you learn more about the Lord. How does it work? You're going to see now. That you never ever stop learning because God puts you on the wheel of the potter. And I want to give you a saying to take home with you today. If you want to continue doing the will of God, you'd better stay on the wheel of God. You'd better stay in the place where you allow him to work in and upon your life. Never ever stop learning. Friends, for Jeremiah, the knowing was in the going. Revelation always follows obedience. Jeremiah, get up and go to the potter's house. I'm going to teach you something. Jeremiah could have said, it's not Sunday. It's cold outside. I'm not going to church. This doesn't work for me today. If you don't go in obedience, the revelation often doesn't follow. Are you hearing me? God says to Abraham, doesn't he? Go up the mountain of the Lord. It'll be provided there. And only when he took Isaac up and he saw the ram, did he get the revelation of substitution for death. The righteous will live by faith. If he hadn't gone up, he never would have walked it. Abraham would not today be the father of our faith. And I want to say to you that your obedience, your going, always prompts what you learn. To get up and go, and so must we who wish for spiritual lives to mature. You can't sit and stagnate. 
We must be obedient to the truth God gives. Let me ask you this. Why must God give you truth that will go unused? Why? We all think God's just there. You, Lord, I'm here to have my quiet time. I've got my coffee. I've got my attitude. Okay, Lord, speak. Who are you that God should speak to you when you decide? I'm just asking. Some of us need to grow a little bit in our understanding of the sovereignty of God. That the Spirit may whisper. The Word may speak. The Spirit may give leanings and promptings. But when God talks, God talks and you pay attention. You sit to attention and you listen. And, you, and when He says, God, a potter's house, you go. Are you listening? You've got to be going, friends. Don't ever slow down. You're here, so I'm not preaching to you right now, but I want to say this. I don't understand a person who gets saved and isn't a church on Sunday. You'll never miss work Monday to Friday. But when it comes to God, it's a bit of a negotiation. I just want to say to you, I'm 10 or 11 days out of a hip replacement, and I'm standing here. I don't want to even hear your excuses. You get yourself to church. You get yourself to the place where God can talk. Don't ever decide, I give Pharaoh on my Monday to Friday, but say, Lord, is it okay if I go to church? What is this? It's no negotiation, yeah? When you've got saved, you're there. Are you hearing me? Now I'm speaking to you, you are here. So, well done. But get what I'm saying. Jeremiah, go to the potter's house. If he hadn't gone, none of this would happen. Number one, point number one, Jeremiah's art experience. Art is creative, intentional. Art only makes sense after watching it for a while. It's not in my notes, but did you ever see that thing of that, that beautiful statue of a horse, a powerful horse, being designed out of marble, and the oak was cutting it, chipping it away? Have you seen that thing? So the first half looks beautiful. The rest is just this thing of marble. And the guy went to the sculptor, and he said, how do you... How do you make this horse out of marble? He said, it's easy. I just look at the marble and I chip away everything that doesn't look like a horse. I know he's just saying something. But can you imagine what it looks like when you're on the wheel of the potter and he looks at your life and he simply says, I'm going to do something with you. And every part of you that doesn't look like me, I'm just going to work with. It's a beautiful picture. Jeremiah wakes up. To the reality that God permeates everything around us. Friends, we've had a few very interesting weeks as a country. The rand's going down. U.S. is putting pressure on us. Our government can't make up if we're non-aligned or we're supplying Russians. We don't know where we are. Uh, you know, ESCOM, they can't even get to work because the lights are off. Everything's a mess. And I bet you some people have got their passports out. Where am I going? When am I going? How am I going? And you've forgotten that the book of Daniel and the book of Jeremiah reminds us that God is absolutely in control all the time of everything and nothing is happening without His foreknowledge. All He's doing is exposing and removing the wrong things. And can I tell you, we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So if anything in our lives has been shaken right now, it's not kingdom. Allow God to do what He does. Because can I tell you, whether you're in the USA, in Hawaii, in Australia, I'm trying to think of places people immigrate to, England, God forbid, or here, no matter where you are, I want to tell you that when you are grounded and you're on the wheel of the potter, you are in the safest place you could ever be because He is there with you. And it doesn't matter where you land up going. And He's got to learn this God permeates everything around us. God also shows us what our lives look like from the outside, from the inside. I don't know if that piece of pottery understood how marred and broken it was. It forces us to examine what we're doing, what's God doing. Jeremiah stayed attentive and sensitive to God's direction. Go down to the potter's house. When you get there, I'm going to talk to you. Folks, we're called to live by faith. And I just want to say to you right now that faith is not a leap out of the everyday. Faith is a plunge into the depths of every day. Some of us are so full of faith that we are so Colossians chapter 3 that we're seated in heavenly places that are here. We're useless. Absolutely useless. We quote scriptures that comes out of our ears, but our lives are a disaster. Faith is exercised here. Faith is exercised now. We live by faith. We see by faith. We walk by faith. 
Faith is the currency of the kingdom of God. Faith brings the reality. God, you are here, you are present, you're alive, and you're with me. It brings it into our lives. Faith is our responding to God's leading. Listen, if you don't walk by faith, you don't get anywhere in the Christian life. So he says, go down to the potter's house. Can I tell you, in the 7th century, which is when this was written, in the 7th century, when he said, go down to the potter's house, he doesn't get his Google out and look where's the potter's house. Every village had a potter. Now, I just need to give a disclaimer. When I start talking pot and potting, for all of you who extra get it, I'm talking about a vessel. It's a clay jar thing that looks like this that you make. Okay, it's not grown. Doesn't have leaves. Are oh, you right? It's, it's this. Stay with me. The potter was a craftsman. Everyone knew where his house was. Do you know how significant clay is? Uh, pot, pottery is. You know how significant it is. Do you know that the invention of pottery set off a revolution? Before pottery, there was only wandering tribes. They followed herds of animals, going from one food supply to another, forced to move because the animals are moving or because of drought, famine, or lack. No time to develop anything. No time for leisure. No time to reflect. It was hand-to-mouth, day-to-day survival. They had tents and they moved. When the animals moved, they moved. Our forefathers. Because there was nothing. The invention of pottery suddenly made it possible to store and to carry. Now you can stay in a place for a while because you can harvest grain, put it in a pot and protect it and look after it. Cooking was done. Merchandise transported. The invention of pottery, I don't know who came up with it, but the invention of pottery broke into the revolution that today we call civilization. Try to imagine how life would change for you and me tomorrow if suddenly there were no containers to store anything in. Imagine you go home today. No pots, no pans, no bowls, no dishes, no buckets, no jugs, no cans, no barrels, no brown paper bags, no cardboard boxes, no grain silos, no oil, petrol storage things. What would happen if we couldn't store anything? Life would be reduced to what you can carry in a single day. And you get up tomorrow morning and it's the same. Life made it possible for community to develop. It's interesting, eh? Where is this thing going? Because God is making a series of pots, containers, able to carry what he wants to do in and through them. You're going to see where we're going now. Jeremiah had seen potters at work all his life. Today he saw something different. He saw God at work. God said, when you watch the potter making this clay, I want you to see me. I want you to see me through this. What was God doing? He was creating a people of God. God was creating people shaped and created in his image. Everyone necessary, everyone beautiful. You know, every single human being has a part to play in what God's doing. Every single human being is unique. God formed you in your mother's womb for himself. Are you okay? I'll get somewhere with that now. Point number two. The pot got spoiled. But the pot he was shaping, verse 4, from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. The uh, message version says, whenever the pot the potter was working on turned out badly, as sometimes happens when you're working with clay, the potter would simply start over and use the same clay to make another pot. Jeremiah knew about that. Jeremiah knew that pots, containers, people are marred, are messed up. All he had to do was look around him. Men and women with impurities and blemishes that resist the hand of the Creator. Like us, Jeremiah rubbed shoulders every day with people who were not useful. Would you agree that people on this planet, they breathe air, we call them oxygen thieves? But they're useless. They don't benefit society. No one's life is changed for the good because they're in it. The imperfections in their lives means that they leak. They're pots that cannot contain what you put inside it. Something leaks out. They can't hold. What did a pot normally hold? Grain. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Grain. They hold water, salvation, and they hold oil, the Spirit of God, and wine. 
He says, and sometimes these vessels that he creates can't contain what he wants to do. Does he throw it away? Does he reject it? Does he put it away? No. He simply reshapes from the same one. He is so faithful. He never leaves or forsakes those he has created. If you will just come to him and allow it, just stay on the wheel. Allow God to do what God wants to do. God presses and pushes and pulls and needs. You know what? His creative process starts over again, patiently, skillfully. God doesn't give up. God never throws away what is spoiled or marred. He simply starts again. Someone once said to me, I loved it. He said, you never, ever, ever fail a test that God gives you because he allows you to go through the test again and again and again and again until you pass. There's no failure with God. He just lets you. You want to go around the mountain X many times? Go around, but eventually you're going to go through. George Herbert, the old preacher from the 1700s, describes God's activity like this. He says, storms are the triumph of God's art. For those of you going through a hard time, oh Lord, this is difficult, things are rough, things are whatever. That storm is the triumph of God's art. All he is doing is reworking the pottery into something that he can hold, something he can use, something he can put himself into. Jeremiah has to learn this. Point number three. There's a message of hope and there's a message of warning. Jeremiah 18 verse 6. Can't I do, the message says, can't I do just as this potter does, people of Israel? Watch this potter. In the same way the potter works his clay, I work on you, the people of Israel. And then I gave those two things I read you just now. God says, and I'm reading out of, the, out of the message. At any moment, I may decide to pull up a people or a country by the roots and get rid of them. But if they repent of their wicked lives, I'll think twice, I'll start over with them again. At another time, I might decide to plant a people or country. But if they don't cooperate and they won't listen to me, I will think again and give up on the plans I had for them. I want to make an important point to you this morning. The clay can frustrate the potter's intention and cause him to change it. In the same way that the quality of the clay determines what the potter can do with it. The quality of a people determines what God can do with them. And some of you, like, remember King Saul? God says to King Saul, if you will not fail to obey me and worship me and keep my commands, you will not fail to have a son on the throne. Bang. Gone. David came in place. David messed it up, yet David went to God and God says, I found no one like him. Because his heart stayed after me, even through. David, I reckon from time to time, jumped off the pot as well. I reckon he jumped straight back on again. Saul couldn't be interested. And I want to tell you that the quality of the clay, the quality of a people determines what God can do with that people. Don't ever think that because God's got a plan for your life, you can live how you want, say what you want, do what you want, and think everything is going to happen the way it was always meant to. No, God will refashion. He'll break down and rebuild if we don't listen. The people didn't respond. They did not willingly involve themselves in the shaping process. God says to Jeremiah, go and give them this word from the potter. Let me tell you what they're going to say. Verse 12, they will reply, it's no use. We'll continue with our own plans. Each of us will follow the stubbornness of his evil heart. Message Bible says, why should we? What's the point? We'll just live the way we always live, doom or no doom. I want to say this. One of the most disheartening things I recognize in ministry is people who are stuck with their lives and on, insist on living the way they always have without having the courage to change. They rather live in their nonsense, making excuses for it, knowing their weaknesses, without ever saying to God, okay, here I am. I understand things aren't as they should be. It's so sad. But here's the thing, and this is where this church plays a role. Jeremiah will not agree to leave them in their mess. He's literally fighting for them when they're not fighting for God's purposes in their own lives. And that's the role of a Christian. That's the role of a church. We literally get involved fighting for those who do not want to fight for themselves. They're not interested. And we knock on the door and we pray for them. I want to tell you a quick testimony. Can I? The 8 o'clock meeting this morning, after prophetic words came from different people, a young man sitting just over there gave his life to the Lord. He went into clinical depression, lost a great job at FNB. 
battled. Things went horribly wrong and we've been praying for him. And his best friend is in this church. And him and I have prayed in agreement with him. And we've spoken over his life, whatever. And I have not seen that oak in three years. He came to the 8 o'clock meeting this morning and gave his life to Jesus. He repented. Stood here in front. His wife and him were crying buckets. And he met with me afterwards in the room next door. It was the most beautiful thing to see. And you know why? Because we insist on fighting for those who will not fight for themselves. And you, most of you are here because other people stood in the gap for you when you were such a lazy sod, you wouldn't even stand in the gap for yourself. Am I right? My own sister prayed for me for six months to get saved when I wasn't interested. And then God hit me. Jeremiah continues to preach, continues to comfort. It's what we do. It takes conviction. It takes energy. But we've got to stick doing, saying what you say, even if people aren't listening. You never know in the planting of your seeds if God isn't doing something. Number four, God is the potter. This was like one of the most powerful sermons Jeremiah ever gave. You tell you what, Jeremiah experienced this preach before he ever preached it. He lived it before. He, this came out of his inner life. I mean, Jeremiah 1 verse 4, 5. Before I formed or shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. His truth was that God was shaping him before he was born. Friends, it's your truth. Some of you wish you were somewhere else. I wonder how many oaks in this room wish you were Brad Pitt. Really? Do you remember when that movie came out, Mr. Joe Black? What? Me? Now, half the chicks wanted to die because if that's death, I'm in. But you are beautifully created the way God wants you to be for a reason that He wants to, and I'm going to get onto it in a moment. But I want you to realize that the life of faith is very physical. It's real. It's practical. Being a Christian, friends, is being present in this world. Space, times, things. It means throwing yourself back on the potter's wheel and saying, God, shape my life into something beautiful and useful even when it's worth it. I want to tell you, Jeremiah's potter shows me what I can become as I submit my life to the creative and merciful God. You see, my life becomes pottery that makes possible the emergence of Christian civilization. Pottery caused civilization. Christian pottery causes what Jeremiah called the people of God. What Jesus called the kingdom of God. What Augustine called the city of God. Can you imagine a whole lot of pots here being formed and shaped by God, marred, rebuilt into beautiful containers to hold the grain and the oil and the water and the wine so that God can take your life and minister to others through it. That when they look at a piece of pottery, they see the beauty of the hand of the creator. You cannot live in a place any longer where people look and say, well, I see God, I just don't see him in you. We've got to become a reflection of the creator. We are containers. Love, mercy, salvation is conserved and shared in us. Everything now makes sense. The purpose of my creation is God formed me before I even wanted to serve him. Till today, I never wanted to be a pastor. Till today, I never wanted to lead a church. I was studying law at, at UJ. That's what I want to do. God grips me, changes me, saves me, and says, this is what I've got for you. What is my answer as a pot when the potter says, this is what I want? The answer is yes, Lord. You don't fight him to do whatever you think. Number five, almost done. God has, my leg's going numb. God has six things. Really, I'm going to fall over now. God has six things to say about the pot that he has formed. Are you ready? Number one, God has a purpose. I saw him working at the wheel. Can I just say this? The potter wasn't playing with a clay. The potter wasn't amusing himself. He's not a five-year-old in a mud pit building a little horse and going, mm, another one. And, mm. God doesn't play with your life. God doesn't mess around with you. Everything it does is intentional. A potter has a serious investment in the product. God has a serious investment in you. It doesn't mess around. Number two, creation is a good thing that's gone bad. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. It wasn't marred by the hand of the potter. It's human responsibility. We messed up through ourselves. 
at a national level, Judah and Israel was marred. Friends, modern South Africa is marred. It's messed. Can the marred clay help itself? Of course not. It needs the hand of the potter. Its shape, its destiny from beginning to end rests in the hands of the potter if we'll allow him to work upon our lives. Point number three, the good thing that went bad has been recreated. So the potter formed it into another pot, verse four. In that split second, Jeremiah is standing there. He's watching this. This potter creates something and there's something wrong in the clay. He doesn't throw it away, he doesn't reject it. He simply starts again with it. And I think in that moment, Jeremiah saw what you and I should be seeing today. How the kingdom of God comes into a person's life and brings change instantly. How the power of the kingdom to come breaks into the kingdom that's here. And God causes change. I want to tell you, have you ever stopped to think why I'm a preacher? Have you ever stopped to think, what do I do here every Sunday? Do you think I preach here every Sunday because I want to look at your faces? I mean, you're beautiful. You must make no mistakes. But I can take a picture and look at that. That which gets me up here every single week is the absolutely firm conviction that anybody who surrenders their life to Jesus Christ gets their lives transformed by the power of the hand of the potter. I have seen Jesus. I can look at you. I wish I could get some of you to stand up right now that I can tell stories of how your life has transformed since you walked in these doors simply because the Spirit of God got a hold of you. Our conviction is that that which is good, which was broken, has been recreated. And my strength and my conviction lies in the fact that I don't promote God, then push God, then make God do stuff. We simply announce Him and He goes to work. And everyone who ever responds to you on a Sunday, there's got to be the supernatural work of the Spirit in that person's life. Or what are we doing? It's the proof. As we see these beautiful pots being reformed. I reckon it keeps us going. Number four. The new creation was God's idea. Shaping it as seemed best to Him. Do you realize God didn't call a community meeting or a church meeting and say, what should we do? God formed you into a vessel for Himself. Can I say that again? When, listen to me please, when you were formed in your mother's womb, and you know some of you look around and think, I wish I looked like this, I wish I had that one skill set, why am I like this? <laughs> I just want to say to you, bear with me, I know I'm on drugs, but bear with me for a moment. <laughs> I want to say this to you. Do you know that you were formed in your mother's womb, listen now, because God made you in a way that seemed best and most pleasing to him, not to you, to him. It is an incredibly powerful truth. God formed the world in six days and said, I am pleased. It is good. God formed you and said, you are good. You looked around and said, oh, well, I, don't have, I don't have that curse of comparison that we allow in our lives so much. You live pleasing to him. Number five. The potter has prerogative, the rights and the privilege. Not only was the new pot the result of his vision and workmanship, it was his pleasure and his possession to do with as he pleases. The psalmist says in Psalm 115, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 45, woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him who is but a pot's herd among the pot's herds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Friends, please hear me. I didn't want to do what I do. Now I do, but I didn't. God gripped me out and called me to something. And as a pot formed on the wheel of the potter, all I can do is say yes to what he's asked me to do. So are you. As a husband, wife, mother, father, business person, called of God, gifted of God, whatever, you have no response but to say yes to the hand of the potter. Give him the privilege. And lastly, the pot has responsibility. Here we see the interplay between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of humankind. And I want to say to you, it's almost my last point. We are absolutely accountable as a people for our response to the act of God's grace and God's brilliance in our lives. When he says, I will form you if you'll just obey me, I will bless you. 
please understand that if negative things then follow in your life, it's because of choices you've made, not choices he's made. He said to Israel, get back on the, get back on the wheel. I want to reform you for my purposes. If not, judgment is coming from the north. They didn't listen, judgment came from the north. All they had to do was listen to their God. Last point. There's hard lessons for hard play. I can't read the scripture now. Jeremiah 18. But the sovereign potter, God, wanted to form Judah into a useful pot, but she was brittle, set in her resistance to his purposes, said no, said we won't do it. How do you think Jeremiah felt when he gets a word from God, a hopeful word, brings it to a people, and instead they say, actually, we're going to kill you and we're going to listen to other prophets. We don't want to hear what you've got to say. Parts of South Africa will listen. Parts will not listen. Your response is to say, yes, Lord. And wherever he's placed you to do the best you can to allow his life to flow through you. There are self-avowed rebels shaking their fists in the face of a sovereign God. And I want to tell you, they're in for a lesson. You don't play with God. Judah violated common sense. Remember I said there, the snow of Lebanon. Hey? Does the snow of Lebanon never cease to flow? Do its cool waters from distant sources ever cease? You know what God was doing? Lebanon, right next to Israel, has got high mountain peaks. Right through the year, snow settles on the high mountain peaks of Lebanon. What does the snow do? It melts. What does it then do? It runs as rivers and feeds Israel. And what does God say? I, in my sovereignty, have set apart water from a distant source. In other words, you didn't create it yourself. It comes from me. I've set apart water to flow into your life. But you know what? You rather went and burnt incense to flipping idols instead of allowing fresh water to flow into the pot of your life and contain my presence. And all I wanted to do was reshape you, remold you on the wheel that you can get over your sorry little self and you can start to be filled with grain and, and water and wine and oil that I can take you and cause civilization to flow through you. But you know what? You wouldn't even take the flowing of the water. You lost your common sense and you went after things of this world. I close with a sentence. All God wants from his people is that you and I would get back on the wheel of the potter and allow him to fashion us for his purposes. Stand with me, please. Thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today. Um, can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just maybe liking it or putting uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know how the ministry has helped you? Maybe a thumbs up maybe you can subscribe to the channel do whatever just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you and secondly you may be someone who's saying Greg I hear you and this 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 hope that Jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me but the reality is that I don't even know if I know Jesus I want to say two things to you right away the first is he's near you right now the Bible says if you believe in your heart that He is the Lord and if you confess Him with your mouth, you will be saved. Which means you just need to, where you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, even now. And just say, Lord, here I am. I recognize who you are. I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the Son of the living God. And I want to follow you. I want to become a disciple of yours. I want to, I want to give my life to you, Lord. And you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord. Secondly, you can get hold of us um, you can see the telephone number. You can get hold of us and say, hey, I've given my life to the Lord. Can you help me from here on out? And we could either send you some material. We can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you. Uh, if you live in our area, you can come to us. You can follow us on YouTube. But it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.